And if you think about it, everything we do from the way we share information to the way we buy things to the way we build community mm -hmm. has been disrupted mm -hmm. through digital. And when I look at it, one of the most exciting parts of the digital transformation is the ability to scale across geographic boundaries and mm -hmm. to do that much more quickly. Welcome, welcome to The Rosie Effect, where I give you the keys to lead digital transformation. I'm your host, Rosie M. Ponsa. Today's guest, Jennifer Dulski. Jennifer Dulski is the CEO and founder of Rising Team, a company that provides tools, data, and community to turn managers into amazing coaches that help your teams succeed. Prior to Rising Team, Jennifer led Facebook groups, a product used by more than 1 billion people to create and engage in communities that matter to them on topics from parenting to health to passion hobbies to mobilizing around disaster response. Before Facebook, Jennifer spent four years as president and COO of Change.org, a social impact company that empowers people globally to start and win campaigns for change. She was an early Yahoo employee and led one of the company's six business units as group VP and general manager of local and marketplaces. In 2007, Jennifer left Yahoo to become CEO of DealMap, a mobile local deal site that Google acquired in 2011, making Jennifer the first woman to sell a company to Google, where she led Google Shopping and product listing ads. A prominent thought leader in Silicon Valley, Jennifer writes frequently about management and leadership for LinkedIn influencers, Fortune and Huffington Post. She's currently a board member at Weight Watchers International and ICE 9 one one Research, a nonprofit dedicated to safety, preserving Arctic ice. Jennifer has also served as a board director at Tegna, uh, Move Inc., Little Passports, and She++. Her first book, Purposeful, gotta grab a copy, was published by Penguin Portfolio in 2018 and is a Wall Street Journal bestseller. Let's get in the conversation of digital transformation with leaders. Welcome, Jennifer. Jen, welcome so much, and thank you for taking time to chat with us here at The Rosie Effect. My pleasure. Uh, it's so good to see you. The amazing work that you're doing um, with technology transformation, with change management, the impact on people, especially with what's going on right now. I know leaders have an immense opportunity to figure out where do we go from today? So I'm excited to take some of your expertise, your knowledge, and figure out how does um, a leadership team, how do they define uh, digital transformation to be successful? Well, I think um, the way that I think about digital transformation is that it really truly has transformed the way we go about doing everything in our mm. lives. And of course, I've yes. been working in digital since the sort of mid to late 90s, so quite a long time, since the beginning of this real internet digital disruption. And if you think about it, everything we do from the way we share information to the way we buy things to the way we build community mm -hmm. has been mm -hmm. disrupted through digital. And when I look at it, one of the most exciting parts of the digital transformation is the ability to scale across geographic boundaries and mm -hmm. to do that much more quickly. So as an example, if you take something like community building, where I've spent a lot of time you know, it used to be that the only way to find other people who shared those common causes or passions or life experiences with you was to find them in a group nearby you. And that meant oftentimes you really couldn't find them because there aren't always people who share your experiences who, who just happen to be nearby. That's true. And when we look at what's happened with the digital transformation, all of a sudden, you know, no matter what it is, if you are you know, someone like take something like adoption, which is not something that's always publicly discussed. Mm -hmm. You don't always know who those people are. Let's say you want to talk to other people who have themselves been adopted or are adoptive parents. That was hard to do in the past. And now all of a sudden you find communities online where people right, can connect over engaged. topics like that or health issues that previously were hard to find, yeah. parenting, any of your passionate hobbies. So mm -hmm. digital has allowed us to do things that were really never possible before. 
Mm-hmm. So within an organization like that, when you have leadership looking to define how are we going to measure success? And I see a lot of customers having this question, right? Yes, we need to go from where we are now to where the vision is so we can deploy you know, valuable technologies to our customers. But how should leadership really think about defining what success looks like? Yeah, so I think this really depends, you know, based on your business. So first you have to understand your organization and what yeah. your mission is and what key metrics will be used to measure your mission and your goals in general. Uh, But when you add a layer of digital on top of it, I think there are two things to think about. One is what are the ways to measure success in the digital world to begin with that might not be as common in an offline or physical world. So Mm -hmm. a good example there is engagement. You know, what, what are the ways that people are actively getting involved with your products in a digital way? How long are they spending engaged with what you're doing? Those kind of metrics tend to matter more digitally. And then the other thing I encourage people to think about is what I call um, tipping point metrics. So if you can understand Mm. the things that happen that cause your product or business to get from one level to the next, that's something to keep an eye on. So a good example, you know, let's say, again, if we go back to online communities, Mm. when I was looking at how to make them successful, we looked at the data and we said, groups that have at least 50 people in them within the first month are much more likely to be active than groups that don't. That's a good example of tipping point metric. Mm -hmm. So then you can say, okay, how do we build our product to make sure that it's easy to invite and grow groups to pass that 50 person threshold Mm -hmm. in the timeframe we need them to Mm -hmm. do it. Mm-hmm. And with your expertise from change.org, um, by the way, I copped a copy of your book, so I can't wait <laughs> to dig deeper into it. You really come with that deep expertise in helping leaders be able to define, as you said, that unique tipping point me- metric that they need to understand where they are right now and where they need to be with that transformation. That's right. And we would do the same thing at change.org as an example. So we would say, what does it mean to have a quality petition? Mm. You know, how many people do you need to have signed it and commented on it in the first, you know, X number of days for mm. it to be likely to grow on its own? And then we could look at characteristics of those petitions that were more likely to then hit hit that tipping point. So for instance, mm. a petition with a photograph or a nice photograph is much more likely to be successful than one without it. And then you can also do all, the the beauty of digital, of course, is the power of A-B testing. You know, you can test (laughs) unlimited numbers of headlines and images and so forth to see what will actually perform best and resonate most with people. Yeah, yeah. Well, I mean, you know what's going on right now, digital disruption is all around us. There was a quote I recently read that was like, if you haven't begun on this journey, COVID will do it for you. So what is your advice with your, with your expertise in really helping business leaders to position themselves, right, to make sure that they are actually surviving during this time? And then also moving forward, how does, um, you know, those that are, are tasked with leading the digital transformation within their organizations, how do they position those, those measures to, to thrive moving forward? So... While this is a very difficult time, and I certainly don't want to ignore that, I also think it's a time that is presenting a lot of opportunities to people who work in organizations to take advantage of the fact that it isn't life as usual, and we are going to need to change some of the ways that we behave. So a good example here is I'm also on the board of WW, formerly Weight Watchers. Mm -hmm. Um, That was a business that had... Um, so, you know, an app. So there was a digital component and also a lot of physical studios where people would meet for workshops offline. Mm. And it became quite clear when COVID happened that we needed to close the studios because all of the you know, locations yeah. around the world were sheltering in place. You can't have people meeting together. And we had known for a long time that we wanted to do more in digital. And all of a sudden, this became you know, an incredible opportunity to accelerate some of the work that we knew we wanted to do anyway, Mm -hmm. because we had to move in that direction. And so it gave us the opportunity to shift things on the product roadmap and actually do some things more quickly or more boldly than we had previously been thinking about. So that's Mm -hmm. the way I encourage leaders to think about it is what trends are there that that this is accelerating, which would be good for your business anyway over the long term? And how can you use this moment in time 
to do that kind of ruthless prioritization, to take yeah. things out of your roadmap that maybe can't be there right now or shouldn't be there right now to accelerate other things. I want to delve a bit deeper if you can touch on, you know, what unique thing that, you know, you led to put into place that, you know, took advantage of the digital space and the community of people that you're serving. So again, in this particular example that I'm sharing, I'm a board member, so it's not me building the product, but it's more that, advising. Um, yes, yes. But yes. I can talk about what the team did, which I thought was very impressive. And basically, again, they had a digital app already, but they mm -hmm. did a few things to accelerate the digital elements that I thought were really smart. One is they moved e-commerce into the app. So they previously had had people buying um, physical products like food and snacks and things in the studios when they went mm. to the workshops. Well, all of a sudden that was closed. So how can we turn on buying through the app so people don't lose access to the things that they're wanting to get? Um, the second is that they opened um, virtual group um, studios, if you will, like you couldn't meet oh. in person. So they created these kind of Zoom meetings for everybody to gather digitally they the same way we all are, right. you know. Um, and then the third thing is they're working on launching what they call virtual group coaching. So, okay. you know, the physical world has a, an actual person who leads the workshop. And so the question is, how can you bring leaders online and build communities through the app? Wow. And, you know, all the different measures and really unique way that they're taking advantage um, and so looking to deliver value to the end consumer. I keep hearing this thread of that, those people, the people that are leading that transformation. So what would you share um, that, and especially with your new organization that you're leading, what are those elements you're looking for, right? When it comes to putting together that team that is able to think, right, moving forward, that is able to think digital first, um, really to be able to still deliver that value to the end consumer. So as you mentioned, I'm building a new company now called Rising Team. Yeah. Uh, the goal of Rising Team is to help managers become great coaches that help their teams reach their full potential. And the way that we think about it is that you know, for, for a long time, we know that how engaged your employees are is a major factor in how successful your business is. Mm -hmm. And now when you look at the research, it basically says that over 70% of employee engagement can be explained by the quality of individual managers on your team. Mm. But the vast majority of managers have really not ever had the right training, support, or tools um, to be able to do their jobs really, really well. And mm -hmm. the way that I think about it, especially in a digital world and where we're going to much more remote virtual work, this is more important than ever. Yeah. So, yeah. you know, what's been available in the past to leaders of teams is executive coaching, which is, you know, expensive and usually only available to a small select kind of senior group of leaders mm -hmm. um, or training, you know, which you can get online or you can read books. But the problem is that even when you get this training, it's hard without having real tools to implement things on a daily basis into your routine. So what we're building at Rising Team is tools to help people actually practice the things that they're learning and mm -hmm. bring it into yeah. their real lives. And I think that's the key for me from a digital perspective of making this work is both having the content, which might be, you know, interviews like this or mm -hmm. other things that you can do digitally, mm -hmm. but also pairing it with tools to help people implement what mm. they're learning. Mm. And you, you, you said it right on because you know, a lot of organizations are going through changes right now. And so when it comes to rebuilding teams, when it comes to, you know, rethinking what that structure will look like moving forward, this is absolutely the right time to have an organization like yours be able to come in and really help them from beginning, implementing things like, you know, the, the, what's the value when you look at diversity, when you look at inclusion, what's the value of the people that are leading the team? So that means, you know, the question that's coming up, uh, you know, <laughs> How should leaders be able to integrate diversity and inclusion with the transformation and the opportunity that we have here forward, right? I think um, a lot of it has been discussion and conversation, which is amazing. But when it comes to implementation and impact, how do we really, you know what I mean, get the, get the meat on the bone moving forward? Yeah. So I would start with the first by saying diversity is critical, period. Like there is no question about this. And if you look at the data, it says that diverse teams in terms of 
you know, multi-generational, gender, race, you know, geography, anything you can imagine, the more diversity you have of those experiences on your team, the better decisions your team will make and the better your business will perform. So there are no questions about that. The question is, how do you make it work within a right. team and how do you help people understand how to actually work effectively with people who are different and might mm-hmm. bring different experiences and perspectives? Yeah. And so what I think about is, You know, first, you want to make sure that if you want your product or your business to be broadly representative, that you have a team that is broadly representative, so you represent your audience well. And then, as I said before, you need tools to help both the leaders and the individuals on those teams work effectively together. So one example, um, again, if we go back to what we're building at Rising Team, our premise is that great managers are like great coaches, like Mm. sports team coaches or orchestra conductors, et cetera. They do what we call the three C's. One is they coach their team, meaning that they deeply understand each individual on their team and how to help that person both leverage their talents and grow over time. So we have a whole series of assessments that people take when they join Rising Team about identifying their talents, their motivators, their learning styles, their work preferences. And if you can, again, get underneath understanding each person, then it's about the person as a human being, right? And those same questions, what are you good at? What do you care about, et cetera, are relevant Again, whether you're male or female or black or white or gay or straight, like you want to understand the real human being. Mm -hmm. And then the second C is what I call clarify, which is how do you lay out and articulate a clear plan for what success looks like and who is doing what on the path to get there. Because oftentimes where teams go awry, and this is true of diverse teams too, is that there's confusion over what is expected. There's no accountability. Exactly. So this is to create accountability and transparency. And the third piece is the third C, which I call connect, which is how do you make a team feel like a team? You want it to be a community. And so all that I've learned about building these digital communities comes into play here about how do you help people, you know, understand each other on a deeper level, but also learn to have fun together and and all of those things. Yeah, yeah. I want to delve a bit deeper in, you know, putting, bringing together so many different backgrounds when you look at even upskilling a workforce that comes with different generations. What is your take or advice on being able to successfully do that within an organization? So again, I think the nice thing about what's happened during this time period is that everybody has had to be more digital, right? I mean, even- You learned. (laughs) Right. And the truth is even, you know, calls with grandma and grandpa are now happening on Zoom or FaceTime because you can't go visit them. And so, you know, my belief is that you know, older generations can understand and use technology as effectively as younger ones. They just need more exposure and more practice Mm -hmm. um, because they haven't grown up with it. You know, I look at my kids, for instance, and, you know, I remember my daughter when she was little taking my mother's phone before my mom had an iPhone and she had this, it must've been a Blackberry or something. And my daughter is just like trying to swipe (laughs) this phone. And she's like, and then she looks, what is wrong with this phone? And where is all your music? Like, why don't you have music on this phone? Um, But the truth is, you know, my mom now does have an iPhone and she does have her music on it and she does swipe and you know, she's 75. So (laughs) I, I really believe this is does not need to be a generational issue. But again, the point that I made before is that people not only need access to technology, they need practice. And so what we need to do is put into place opportunities for people to practice. Mm-hmm. And this is where, again, when I said understanding each individual on a deeper level, like mm-hmm. one of the things that we do at Rising Team is we have a learning styles inventory because mm-hmm. some people you know, everybody can learn by observing digital content, but some people really prefer to learn by, you know, sitting next to someone else and watching them do it. Some people prefer to learn by practicing trial and error themselves. And so understanding each person and trying to get at that style and then give them opportunities to learn the way that is works Mm -hmm. best for them. Mm -hmm. You know, with the value that you're bringing to managers, team leaders, 
um, to be able to redesign and create the new teams. I'm interested to know your perspective or take on what that impact on digital transformation looks like on HR, right, within an organization. So, you know, whether it's from layoffs to skills improvement, what does that look like and how does an organization manage that? Yeah. I mean, my hope here, to be honest, is that organizations will have to do a lot less of performance management and laying off of yeah. people if we do this right, mm-hmm. right? Mm-hmm. Because the whole point is that everybody is talented at something. It's just about finding what that thing that is. Right. Some people, yes, some people are in the <laughs> wrong job. Like it might be that they're in the wrong job. And sometimes it might be that the right job doesn't exist in your organization and you have mm-hmm. to help them find it elsewhere. Mm-hmm. But generally, if you can lock in on what people are good at, there are numerous ways that they can be successful. Mm. There are sometimes other reasons why people don't perform at their best. And those usually have to do with other things going on in people's lives. Like mm-hmm. the truth is we are, our lives are very inextricably intertwined now between yeah. home and work. Mm-hmm. And so, you know, again, like our manager ch- um, one-on-one check-ins, always start with a series of questions that people are tracking using these kind of emojis over time so that, you know, you can ask questions like, how are you doing today? Because it might be what you, we just don't know. It might be the person learned some horrible medical news about someone in their family that day and you don't know, or it might be that, you know, someone, um, you know, I don't know, like my husband is in the military, like people might have someone who's been deployed somewhere, like we just don't know. And so we should first, again, try to start with what are people naturally good at? And how do we help them find that and grow on that path? And then Mm -hmm. we should also take time to understand what might be going on with people that we can help support them with. Mm -hmm. And you keep saying it. And I read a little snippet about your book on that sort of purposeful decision making. And I I, I am hearing that, you know, constantly throughout embedded within um, your your organization. So you are absolutely spot on in being able to have, you know, an employee or a leader be able to identify those key strengths, where their purpose lie, and being able to deploy because they they would even enjoy what they're doing. They will be able to bring their full self, and um, the results of the work for the organization will even be magnified. So I <laughs> totally relate with you on that. Let's. Um, Can I add one thing there? Because I think this is I think the digital transformation is what is allowing what will allow this to happen at scale. Exactly. So, for yeah. instance, the tools that we're creating in rising team will be usable by everyone everywhere. And Mm. then, you know, you could do something like take that assessment as an individual. And even if I change companies, I might be able to say, by the way, here are all these assessments I took and here's what you should know about managing me. Uh And again, you couldn't do that as easily if all these tools had to be written down on paper and pencil. In that process. Let's let's, let's delve a bit into culture. So here we have, right, we've identified the people that are really at the forefront of driving change. How do they look into impacting culture so that it aligns with digital transformation. As we know, technology is the last thing. It's about people and the culture. So let's talk a bit about that. Yeah. Two things I'd say here. One is that um, digital transformation is a lot about change, Yeah. right? Like at the end of the day, it's always changing. It's changing faster than you might expect. Some things work and some things don't work. And so at the highest level, I think the companies that are the most adaptable and have the teams that are the most adaptable will do the best here. Mm -hmm. So in terms of looking for the types of people that you want to hire onto teams that do this. The second thing, um, you you may or may not agree, but I actually really don't like the word culture. um, Tell me more. I know because (laughs) I think that it can exist in a world with pre-existing biases. So I prefer the word values. And I think about, so if you think about values as being the ways that we work together, the things we look for in people we hire, Mm -hmm. um, to me, those things are independent, again, of demographics. You know, you can be, let's say your values are we're adaptable. We persist through our obstacles. Agile. Exactly. Or we, um, we, have high empathy. Like those Mm -hmm. things are independent of whether you're, you know, what race you are, what gender you are, et cetera. 
culture, like people often say things like, we hire people who are a good culture fit. And oftentimes I find them using that as a way to describe other people who are like me. So for instance, they might say, our culture is, you know, we're, we're super fun and we always do happy hour on Fridays or we're really outdoorsy, like everybody loves adventure. Like those things really can lead you to a lot of bias, right? So, you know, happy hour on Friday isn't going to always be doable for, mm-hmm. say, single parents or yeah. wh- whatever it is, right? Yeah. Um and so I prefer to lock this inside values, value. company values. And I think there are certain values that uh, le- you know, align well with companies that are good at transformation. Hmm. I, I want to, this is an interesting point of view. So I want to you know, push in there a little bit more. So if an organization is, is honing in on values and sort of working towards that, does, wouldn't that create sort of the reverse effect in that you might end up with a team that might look just like you because you're just focusing on the elements that is to be delivered versus looking and implementing, you know, what's the value of people and the culture that we're going to look for? What's your take on that? I think maybe it's a semantic difference and maybe it comes from the way that I've heard people use culture. Like it's very common, for instance, in Silicon Valley for people to say, oh, we're going to hire for, they're not a culture fit. Like saying someone is not a culture fit generally means like they're not like me. Uh, And so that's why I I don't like the the word culture. I see. Whereas values, someone who's really not like me at all could have the same value set ethics, you know? and I, OC. exactly uh, 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 okay. and so when i say like as an example at change.org one of the first things i did when i got there was help the company articulate its values and the values were things like we embrace openness that was one of our values mm-hmm. and so we looked for people who were going to be open to people and experiences that were different from themselves. That itself was a value of the company. And that didn't, you know, you didn't have to look or behave any particular way to meet that value, if that makes sense. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm-hmm. All right. So we touched a bit. I think this will d- delve into the value and the way you explained it. Thank you on that. We look at agile, innovative, um, you know, organizations that take advantage of design thinking to build out their teams, right? How with, especially with the initiative that you have in the business that's um, um, up and growing right now, how should leaders really think about implementing these key things within their organization? Yeah. So I think the first thing is, define it, right? So getting that set set of values written down, articulated, put up on the wall, wherever it may be. Mm -hmm. Second thing is hire for it. So in your interviews, make sure that you ask people about these things. If you want innovation, you have to ask people in their interviews, tell me a time when you had an idea for something to solve a problem that was innovative or however you want to ask for it, but you want to make sure you're hiring for it. Third thing is model the behavior yourself as a leader. So if you expect people to do something, you should make sure that you're doing it too. I always said I was a coxswain on the crew team and a lot of people aren't familiar with that role, but it's the the person who kind of sits in the back and strategizes the race and gives feedback Uh, and steers and so forth. And to earn the respect of my team, even though I was not rowing when we were in the boat, I had to do every workout with them outside the boat. Right, because you have to earn the respect and model the behavior that you want people to do. Um, and then the the fourth thing I would say is reward people who demonstrate it. So you know, at Change.org, after we articulated the values, mm-hmm. we built a program called Values Ambassadors, where we said, okay, every quarter we're going to reward one person in our organization who demonstrates each value, and we took value. nominations from the team yeah. and so forth. And so, you know articulate it, hire for it, model it, reward it. Reward it. Yeah. Yeah. And especially, you know, with individuals, if you're able to reward the actions, right, you're creating that ability for continuity and and impact, man. We've basically summed up what the future of work is. And I am super (laughs) excited about this. This has been amazing. Jen, thank you so much for your time. And I'm still going to be creeping to see where your business is going, what the next big thing looks like with your organization. Very, very excited about it. If people are interested in learning more, they can go to risingteam.com. 
Awesome. Awesome. Absolutely. Thank you. That was an amazing conversation with Jennifer, uh, really honing in on what leadership needs to be focusing on when it comes to identifying the right leaders and building teams um, and equipping them with the right skills to be able to lead in purpose. And as you know, as the author of Purposeful, by the way, make sure you grab a copy of her book. Um, thank you, Jennifer. And thank you all for watching and listening to The Rosie Effect. As you know, I can't stress this enough. We don't walk to the Rosie effect.com we run so run to the rosy effect.com that is t-h-e-r-o-z-y-e-f-f-e-c-t.com and subscribe we don't want you to miss out on any of these amazing conversations insights from amazing leaders who are really leading the charge when it comes to transforming organizations um digital transformation across organizations especially in our era of, of disruption until next time, I'm your host, Rosie Amponsa. Thank you.